Please be seated. With, with Pres President Greg Finvis of Emory University and the congregation of Glen Memorial United Methodist Church, I welcome you to this space and this hour as we praise God and give thanks for the life of Rosalind Smith Carter. We gather also, of course, to surround this family with our love as they mourn the loss of a beloved wife mother, grandmother, great-grandmother. Friends, today, let us affirm together the faith Rosalind lived so beautifully. Death, though real, does not have the last word. And God's love is greater than any foe. And the way of service and grace in this world is the way of eternal life, even now. Let us pray. Almighty God, we step away from the demands of the day to give thanks for the life of your child, Rosalind. We celebrate 96 years of faith and love but we rejoice in moments shared with her, memories cherished now as treasures. In this hour, renew our spirits by your Holy Spirit, that we, like Rosalind, might, with courage and grace, do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you throughout our days. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Maya Angelou wrote, when great trees falls. When great trees falls, rocks on a distant hill shudder and lions hunker down in tall grasses and elephants lumber after safety. When great trees falls in the forest, small things recall into silence, their senses eroded beyond fear when great souls die, the air around us become light, rare, and sterile. We breathe briefly. Our eyes are filled with hurtful clarity, and our memory suddenly sharpens, examines the words unsaid and promises of walks never taken. But did you know that in Isaiah, Chapter 40, verse 28 says, Do you not know and have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the earth? He is not, he will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives us strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. And even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But here's where I shout and get happy. Chip, it says, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not go weary. They will walk and not faint. I'm going to have Chip Carter come and tell you about a great soul. I want to welcome all of you here. and Thank you for coming to help my family and to mourn with my family and mostly to celebrate a life well lived. My mother was the glue that held our family together through the ups and downs and thicks and thins of our family's politics. 
as individuals, she believed in us and took care of us. When I was 14, I supported President Johnson for president. And every day I wore a Johnson sticker on my shirt. And periodically I would get beat up and my shirt torn and the buttons pulled off and my sticker always destroyed. And I would walk the block during lunch from school down to Carter's Warehouse and my mother would have a shirt in a drawer, already mended, buttons sewn on, and the LBJ sticker still applied. Years later, she was influential in getting me into rehab for my drug and alcohol addiction. She saved my life. When I started making speeches for Dad and his political career, I was so nervous I often vomited in the waiting room before we went on stage. And one day after debating seven other uh, children of uh, offspring of candidates for president, I called my mother and told her how nervous I got. And she told me something that I have used a thousand times since. She said, Chip, you can do anything for 20 minutes except hold your breath. <laughs> when I was in the second grade at Plains High School, they had a donkey basketball game in the stadium, in the, in the, the uh, school building there, uh, to raise money for the school. And my mother rode her donkey as fast as it would slowly go, <laughs> right under the goal, spun around so she was facing its tail, caught the pass and made the winning two points. She was my hero that night, and she's been my hero ever since. A couple of years ago, Mom and I were talking when she said that Dad asked her, when Dad asked her to marry her for the second time, uh, she said yes. But she expected him to provide with, for her a life of adventure. He told her that it would happen. She told me that she had lived on both coasts in Hawaii while I was in the Navy and began her family. Mom said that when it was decided they would leave the Navy and move back to Plains, that she was upset. And the family story is that they rode in a car from Connecticut to Plains, Georgia, and when Mom had something to say to Dad, she would say, Jack, would you tell your father? <laughs> when Dad ran for office the first time, my mother ended up running Carter's Warehouse. She loved it. Every time he'd go on a campaign trip or during the legislative session, she was really pleased to be in the office and be the boss. <laughs> Excuse me. She told me that when Dad started running for president, that the thing that she enjoyed the most were the people that she met across the country. And that from working in Carter's warehouse, she said, I was able to speak the languages and prices and yields and relate to everyday issues and farm families, especially in Iowa. <laughs> she said because of that, she's the one that helped win that election there. <laughs> then as First Lady of the United States, always trying to follow the teaching of Jesus and to do what he taught her to do as a guideline, she said, you will always get criticized by somebody for everything you do, so you might as well do what right. That she and Deb were able to make a positive difference in people's lives, and that of so many families too. My parents' 77 year partnership is often talked about Mom was always well informed on the issues of the day. In the White House, Mom asked Dad so many questions that he finally said that she should attend cabinet meetings. So she did and caught a lot of flack for that. But she was then able to speak with authority on issues across our country and the world. 
she would often try and often fail to get dad to do what was right politically. And when she couldn't change dad's mind, she would repeat to herself, a leader takes people where they want to go. A great leader takes people where they need to go. Losing the election in 1980 was devastating to us all. My parents were still young, my mother only 53. And they knew they still had more to contribute. They decided they would become missionaries and spent months trying to decide how to accomplish their goal. Finally, they decided as partners to start the Carter Center, which would allow my mother to continue to fight the stigma of mental illness and allow them both to help the poorest of the poor on this earth as Jesus had taught them. Mom started the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregivers at Georgia Southwestern University to train and support those who help others. At the same time, Mom and Dad continued to support Habitat for Humanity, and Mom continued to support the Friendship Force. She told me that her adventures had led her to more than 120 countries. She had been fly fishing all over the world. She had met kings and queens, presidents, others in authority, powerful corporate leaders and celebrities. She said the people that she felt the, the most comfortable with and the people she enjoyed being with the most were those that lived in absolute abject poverty, the ones without adequate housing, without a proper diet, and without access Word. And she had probably had more adventures than anybody else on earth. Mom was always fun to be with. Halloween before the pandemic, Mom showed up at Amy's house. Amy lives on the street which closes down on Halloween and every house is decorated. Mom was, decorated. Mom was beautifully dressed as a monarch butterfly. The Secret Service were dressed in casually but perfectly as Secret Service agents. <laughs> she proceeded to go up and down the street with her grand, great, grand and grandchildren and go trick-or-treating up and down and talk to people all over the street. She got back to Amy's and was so excited because she'd been out so much and nobody had recognized her. After dad went in, was put in hospice and my mother was racked with dementia, my siblings, my wife and I, would stay with them so that there would always be a family member around. One day, my mother was sitting with my wife, Becky, and she was reminiscing on what it was like to go to live in Hawaii. And she was talking about learning all the native dances. And she got up from the sofa pushed her walker away, which she couldn't take a step without, and proceeded to do the hula for two or three minutes. <laughs> she grabbed her walker, turned around, sat back on the sofa, and turned to my wife and said, that's how you do it. <laughs> I will always love my mother. I will cherish how she and dad raised her children that given us such a great example of how a couple should relate. Let me finish by saying that my mother, Rosalind Carter, was the most beautiful woman I've ever met and pretty to look at too. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. Next, we'll have the reading of the Lord's Prayer. Would you read it with me, please? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the glory and power and the glory forever. Amen. reading from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. President Biden, Dr. Biden, President Carter, Jack, Chip, Jeff, Amy, very distinguished guests and friends. Rosalind Carter was my boss and became my very good friend. She hired me to direct her projects office at the White House and has kept me busy as her volunteer ever since. We shared so many special times together, shopping for beads in a market in Ghana, popping in unannounced to a peer support program in America's Georgia, bird watching at the Carter Center. What a remarkable woman she was. Wife, mother, business manager, political strategist, diplomat, advocate, author, Yet what I remember most about her was her tireless dedication to taking care of others. She was often fond of recalling the time that Margaret Mead came to visit her in the White House. Dr. Mead said to her then, our success as a society and our value as individuals must be measured by the compassion we show for the most vulnerable among us. In many ways, Dr. Mead had captured the very essence of Rosalind Carter. The issues that claimed her time and attention, mental health, support for caregivers, childhood immunization, problems of the elderly, neglected tropical diseases, even building latrines to prevent the spread of trachoma, a blinding eye disease. These were not glamorous or sexy causes, yet she brought critical leadership to problems that impact the lives of millions. Rosalind's compassion and empathy for those who are suffering was boundless, her passion for action even more so. I shall never forget the day as First Lady she decided to personally visit the refugee camps in Thailand, where thousands of 
Cambodians lay desperately ill and dying. I have to do something, she said. Rosalind was determined to help. The doctors in the camps called her the Yankee Angel because she brought hope where there had been none. As a result of her efforts, a broad coalition came together and raised tens of millions of dollars for refugee relief. Her tenure as First Lady of the United States was just one chapter in a life that was really devoted to caring and doing good for, for others. With President Carter, she founded the Carter Center as one of the world's foremost humanitarian organizations. She invited me one year to join her on a trip promoting guinea worm eradication in West Africa. In a small village in northern Ghana, she insisted I come meet a little boy being treated in a containment center. You have to see the worm, she said. You have to see how much suffering it causes. The alleviation of suffering has been an integral part of Rosalind's life for as long as I've known her. While campaigning for her husband early one morning at a factory gate, a woman covered in cotton dust approached her. What is your husband going to do as governor of Georgia to help my daughter who is suffering from mental illness? Thus began her more than 50 year career as a mental health advocate lobbying first her husband, then the United States Congress, and finally later the WHO to increase support for mental health. When students at her alma mater, Georgia Southwestern, documented the isolation, the stress and burnout that afflicted so many caregivers in their community, she lent her support to the creation of the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregivers. Today, it is a national advocate for programs to build resilience and strength in families navigating the daunting challenges of caring for loved ones, a challenge that her own family has confronted with grace these last few years. Even the plight of the monarch, monarch butterfly did not escape Rosalind's attention. Threatened by loss of habitat and an alarming decline, <clears throat> who, the monarch needed an advocate, and who better than Rosalind? She first started with her garden in Plains, then she created a butterfly trail across Georgia, and finally, she wrote Michelle Obama that the butterflies needed a garden on the White House grounds. A short time later, there was a garden on the South Lawn. <laughs> what a remarkable life she led, born at a time and in a place where segregation was the norm, as a young wife, she joined the fight against racial discrimination in her church and her community. Raised during an era when opportunities for women were limited at best, she became an ardent advocate for the Equal Rights Amendment. She ensured that women were well represented in the senior ranks of government, and she even successfully lobbied her husband for equal pay for her East Wing staff, something for which I shall always be grateful. <laughs> Married at 18 and the mother of three little boys by the age of 25, she became an invaluable business partner in the peanut warehouse operation. When Jimmy Carter decided to run for the state senate without consulting her, the, the last time he ever did that, <laughs> she still pitched in as a key campaigner and political strategist, a role in which she excelled in the years that followed. She served our country as one of its most activist and accomplished first ladies. Her legacy is defined not only by her work in mental health, but also by the multiple roles she played as Jimmy Carter's closest advisor. Personal emissary to the leaders of seven Latin American countries, consultant on his most important speeches, lobbyist for key legislative initiatives, and spokesperson on controversial policy matters. Once, as she departed for Iowa, just two days after the grain embargo had been announced, she quipped, I happen to always be the first one out after a major decision or happening, but it's interesting. Whether it was the Mideast peace negotiations at Camp David or planning strategy for the Democratic Convention in 1980, Rosalind was present and a full participant. 
She loved her time in Washington and was very sad to leave. But she returned to Georgia ready to pursue her passion to, as she once said, use my influence to give voice to those who may be powerless and persuade the powerful to listen. As I had the privilege of knowing Rosalind over the years, I was constantly reminded that for her, life was truly about helping others and finding joy in the simple act of service. She never sought fame, fortune, or accolades for the work that she did, although her accomplishments have been widely recognized and honored. In so many different ways, she promoted a more caring society. A number of years ago, at the end of an interview with Jon Stewart, then of The Daily Show, where she had lobbied him to pay more attention to fighting the stigma of mental illness, and even in jest offered to award him a Rosalind Carter Fellowship to improve his reporting skills, <laughs> he looked at her and said, Mrs. Carter, you are truly one of the good people in this world. Today, we do indeed mourn a remarkable person, one of the truly good people in this world. May those of us who knew and loved her as a friend and colleague honor her life by building on her legacy of caring deeply for the most vulnerable among us.
A reading from the book of Psalm, chapter 19, verse 14. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. President Carter, President Biden, Dr. Biden, Vice President Harris, the second gentleman, President Clinton, Secretary Clinton, Mrs. Bush, Mrs. Obama, Mrs. Trump, distinguished guests and friends. Rosalind Carter would be so pleased to see that she brought all of you together on this day. First, my deepest condolences to you, President Carter, to Jack, to Chip, to Jeff, to Amy, and to your families. I am honored that you asked me to participate today. News reporters and the public figures we cover don't always have the smoothest of relationships. Given the nature of our different roles, our interactions can be uncomfortable at times, the first time I met Ms. Carter, it was 1970, when she was campaigning hard for her husband to be elected governor. It was on the tarmac of a small airport somewhere in the middle of Georgia, and I sensed a wariness on her part. I was only a cub reporter for an Atlanta TV station, so that was understandable. I'm happy to say that the wariness melted away. It may have taken about 40 years for that to happen, but it had by the time she invited me to attend a luncheon in Washington where she was receiving an award for her work on caregiving. She knew that we have a son with disabilities and that caregiving is essential in our lives. I know that my respect and admiration for her goes back to the very beginning. There was always something genuine about Mrs. Carter, a groundedness and a quiet self-assurance despite what she later wrote about her early struggles with public speaking. I covered the Carters through their time as Georgia governor, through the historic and astonishing campaign for the presidency in 1976, through their years in the White House. What we witnessed was a first lady who saw her role as going well beyond the essential warm and welcoming host to being a close and trusted yes advisor. In essence, an extension of the president himself. A first lady who understood the weight of her words and especially her actions. A first lady who cared deeply about the American people, about how government policies and actions affect their daily lives. A first lady who took on tough assignments, who was, in her words, determined to be taken seriously and who wasn't afraid of controversy. That started at the very beginning of her time in the White House when, as you heard, she made big news by sitting in on cabinet meetings. As she put it, there was no way I could discuss things with Jimmy in an intelligent way if I didn't. Continuing her push for something to be done about mental health, the issue she had adopted as First Lady of Georgia, she immersed herself in the subject insisting that ways be found to bring it out of the shadows, to erase the stigma associated with mental illness. She personally lobbied for legislation and she saw it become law. She launched a childhood immunization initiative that led to the virtual elimination of measles as a public health program problem. Just five months into the new administration, she took on an ambitious diplomatic mission that two-week trip to the Caribbean, Central, and South America that she described as more than a goodwill trip. She said she wanted to be valuable, it to be valuable in each country, to bring back their concerns to her husband. She had studied his foreign policy intensely, especially on human rights, 
She took a cram course in Spanish. I was one of the reporters who traveled with her on that 12,000 mile journey. I had not studied Spanish. And I'll never forget the looks on the faces of some of the Latin leaders as they realized that they were dealing with a serious, supremely well-informed and well-briefed representative of the President of the United States, the person closer to him than anyone else. Criticism ahead of time that she would be dismissed melted away. She lobbied for other important legislation, including one of the earliest efforts to cut the cost of health care, the so-called hospital cost containment bill. Mrs. Carter was traveling with the president in Japan to attend an economic summit when word came from Washington that they were a few votes shy, including from a senator who was traveling with them on the bullet train to Kyoto. <laughs> it was Mrs. Carter who spoke to Hawaii Senator Spark Matsunaga, persuaded him to phone in his proxy. The bill passed. And there was the Middle East, 13 days of tense talks among President Carter, Israel's Menachem Begin, and Egypt's Anwar Sadat. Mrs. Carter was the one who suggested first that they meet at Camp David, noting that it was far removed from the pressures and the controversies of Washington. President Carter said she was a partner in his thinking throughout the negotiations. The Camp David Accords have survived as one of the very few enduring agreements to come out of the Middle East. I last interviewed President and Mrs. Carter together in Plains in July 2021 as they were celebrating their 75th wedding anniversary. I asked them how they thought President Biden was doing early in his term. President Carter was very specific on issue after issue and quite complimentary of the new president. <laughs> Mrs. Carter said simply, it's a great relief to have him in office. And what a love story. For 77 years, they adored each other and had much in common, intelligence, compassion, curiosity, courage, and apparently they could both be a little stubborn she often said the most challenging time of their marriage was when they co-authored a book. <laughs> My connection with President and Mrs. Carter is more than professional. It was the summer of 1976 when I met my husband, Al Hunt, who was then with the Wall Street Journal on the Plains High School athletic field, where competitive then-candidate Jimmy Carter organized softball games between his campaign staff with a lot of help from the very fit Secret Service agents. <laughs> and on the other side, the press corps. The press always lost. <laughs> Al and I didn't see each other again until the spring of 1977 after NBC News moved me to Washington to cover the White House. You know, if Jimmy Carter hadn't been elected, we would likely never have gotten married, had three children, and a grandson. So as fate, and only 1,683,247 votes would have it, our lives are connected with theirs. When Jimmy Carter was running for president the first time, a reporter asked Rosalind why she was campaigning five days a week, 20 hours a day. Her answer, it's a labor of love. Besides, I won't have any regrets if he loses, because I am doing everything I can possibly do. That, to me, explains why she did so much, worked so hard throughout her entire life, at the White House and in the many years before and since, championing the rights of the underserved, coming to the aid of the most vulnerable, doing whatever she could to improve the lives of others, so she wouldn't have regrets that she hadn't done everything in her power to do. That's who she was. Without Rosalind Carter, I don't believe there would have been a President Carter. She and the two of you set an example for all of us. I agree with my friend Jim Fallows, who wrote, her memory will be a blessing, her influence on the world will be her monument. 
end quote. Because of Rosalind Carter, millions of lives are better off. What a gift she left. chose something that is hard to read without crying, so be patient. My mom spent most of her life in love with my dad. Their partnership and love story was a defining feature of her life. Because he isn't able to speak to you today, I am going to share some of his words about loving and missing her. This is from a letter he wrote 75 years ago while he was serving in the Navy. My darling, every time I have ever been away from you, I have been thrilled when I returned to discover just how wonderful you are. While I am away, I try to convince myself that you really are not, could not be, as sweet and beautiful as I remember. But when I see you, I fall in love with you all over again. Does that seem strange to you? It doesn't to me. Goodbye, darling. Until tomorrow. Jimmy.
A reading from the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verses 13 to 14. Serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Thank you all for being here. As you can see from the service, music was so important to my grandmother. And it's been just beautiful. So thank you. Governor and First Lady Kemp, thank you. Senators Warnock and Ossoff, thank you. Congress people, Mayor Dickens, thank you all. And again, a special thank you. Secretary Clinton, Mrs. Bush, Mrs. Obama, Mrs. Trump, and Dr. Biden, thank you all for coming and acknowledging this remarkable sisterhood that you share with my grandmother. And thank you all for your leadership that you provided for our country and the world. Secretary Clinton and Dr. Biden, we also welcome your lovely husbands. I mean, uh, this is a difficult day for my family, um, but we have been so enormously gratified by the love and support that we have felt from across the world. So thank you so much. And as Reverend Warnock told me, uh, my grandmother doesn't need a eulogy. Her life was a sermon. And it was a mighty testament to the power of faith and to the power of a deep and determined love. And she lived this public love story that we all know of, that has inspired the world, including in these last days. And I think of all the things she accomplished, her most viral moment was when they were at a baseball game and the Braves put them on the kiss cam. (laughs) And just like today, I mean, people were crying at the Braves game, you know. But we we heard about it for years. It's amazing. But in my family, we all experienced those more private love stories. And she was my grandmother first. And she was like everyone else's grandmother in a lot of ways. Almost all of her recipes call for mayonnaise, for example. (laughs) We all got cards from her on our birthdays. $20 bill in it. When I was 45, $20 bill, (laughs) like, and she was so down to earth, y'all. It was amazing. And one of the stories we've been talking about in my family these last few days is we were on a family trip and we were on a flight on Delta from here to somewhere. And we were all sitting in the back of the airplane together and it took off. And we looked over, my grandmother took out this Tupperware of pimento cheese. And this loaf of bread, and she just started making sandwiches. And, and she gave it to all of us grandkids and everyone else. And then she just started giving them to other people on the plane. And people were sitting there like, Rosalind Carter just made me this sandwich, you know? And they, they couldn't believe it, but she loved people. 
And she was a cool grandma. She was cool. Like, she did Tai Chi with this sword. <laughs> and if you want to see a five-year-old boy be excited, they would come back, Dad, you know Mom Carter has a sword, you know? She once told me about this trip, Papa, that y'all took to Havana in the 50s. She said, y'all went down there for the night and you didn't get a hotel room. And I said, what'd you do? She looked at me like, we danced. <laughs> we slept on the plane. They danced, didn't they? She was a rock for our family, and that's true, but in many ways she was more, as Chip said, an adventurer, a voyager, a mountain climber. She learned to ski in her 60s and then skied for 25 more years. As Chip said, she fished trout streams from Georgia to Wyoming and from Venezuela to Siberia, visited 120 countries, climbed Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Fuji and summited peaks in Bolivia and other places, and I know that she went to the Everest base camp in Nepal. And I can guarantee you that she was looking up at that thing and thinking, if they would just let me. <laughs> and based on what she did, I think she could have done it. She was born just a few years after women got the right to vote in this small town in the south where people were still plowing their fields behind mules. But she was made for these long journeys and she was made to summit these mountains. As they said before, when she started in politics, she'd never talked to a group of people bigger than her Sunday school class. And then she elected a governor and a president. She shaped our national policies. She faced down dictators herself on issues of human rights. She built the Carter Center from an idea into a powerhouse for human rights. And as the chair of that board, I've watched her do it, and it's because she poured out her love. All over the world, and especially, as Kathy said, the end of the road, her 122 countries included Liberia and Mali and Sudan. And it was natural for her to open up her heart to those people, not with pity, but as partners. And she knew in those communities and recognized that ancient steel from rural women who carried their children and their communities on their backs. Whether they're from a 600 person town in South Georgia or South Sudan. As the song says, she knew what comes back when you give your love away. And for my grandmother, what came back was this unshakable strength and this powerful faith and not just an abiding love, but a fierce, determined, adventurous love that sustained her on all of these long journeys. Journeys, like Kathy mentioned, of her guinea worm eradication, which has taken almost 40 years. But the Carter Center's unwavering efforts and their powerful partners in these tiny villages took a disease that affected three and a half million people every year in the poorest parts of the world. And this year, there won't be millions of cases, Papa. This year, we've had seven total cases. And we're in the last mile because she could see far and she kept going was not afraid of these long journeys. Her advocacy for mental health was a 50-year climb that is as remarkable as any other, and it's been mentioned already, but if you imagine just how far our society has come in the last five years on issues of mental health, and you think that she decided in 1970 to tackle the ancient stigma associated with mental illness, it is remarkable how far she could see and how far she was willing to walk. And that effort changed lives, and it saved lives, including in my own family. She was made for these long journeys. The Rosalind Carter Institute helps caregivers because you can't journey alone. Even the Rosalind Carter Butterfly Trail goes 3,000 gardens from Mexico to Canada, help monarch butterflies on their journeys. John Lewis, once said that in all of his marches, 
he only really learned one thing. Don't let him turn you around. That was my grandmother to a T. One of my last memories of her was in a hospital. We were there for my grandfather, but she had her own physical limitations that made it hard for her to walk. She had to practice. She was ready to go for one of these walks, and she picked up this cane. And I looked at the cane. She looked at me, and she said, you know, it's not a cane. And I said, she said, it's a trekking pole. <laughs> she said, it's the exact same kind that those women use when they go to the South Pole. I watched her walk down that hall, that trekking pole, and I followed her, and I just pray that we never lose sight of that path. Amen and thank you. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Be seated. I also want to remind you that I'm going to give you some directions for the house, and that if you violate those directions, some of the first lady's bodyguards might just. You got my message. Remain seated when the procession starts out out of respect for the family. You've heard everything about this great soul. You heard that she was from Plains, Georgia. You heard the fact that she loved and she had compassion even for a butterfly. 
You heard the fact how she loved her grandchildren. And oh, how she loved J.C., Jimmy Carter. But I also have to tell you that she loved J.C., Jesus Christ. And I believe the reason why she did so much of the things she did, because she read in Spanish and English that faith without works is dead being alone. So when she she read the word of God, it went to her head. And then it got in her heart. And somewhere in the kingdom of God, Ambassador Young, she decided to put her hands to the things of God. From her head to her heart to her hands. But Mr. President, she made it a habit. From her head to her heart to her hands, and she made it a habit. If you love our first lady who was global, make it a habit. Take your passion and make it a habit. Link your passion up with compassion. And then there will be peace. And then there will be love. And then we'll have a house united, not divided. She would say thank you to all the first ladies that came and stopped all the traffic in Georgia and Atlanta. <laughs> Mr. President, she say thank you from the time you came down to visit President Jimmy Carter and sat in the living room, you and your beautiful bride. She would say thanks to all of you. Governor, she said, she would say thank you. But I want to tell you something. To all the staff, she would say thank you. But there's somebody in here that's very important. And only them are going to get what I'm about to say. There's some folks that make all this possible. Their sole mission is to make sure you get home safe. For 46 years, men and women of the Secret Service has made sure that she got home safe. For 46 years, they left their families and traveled with Rosalind to make sure, Garth, that she got home safe. For 46 years, they gave themselves Jason, they had ice cream, peanut butter ice cream. They did all the things that she did. For 46 years, they made sure she got home safe. I want to tell each and every one of them, she would tell you, thank you. You got me home safe. Oftentimes, Mr. President, we don't acknowledge those who keep us safe. Rosalind Carter is in heaven, and she did the work of the Lord in the kingdom all around the world. And Don and all the directors for 46 years got her and her family home safe. And I say thank each and every one of you, those that are standing post and those that are listening on the radios right now, thank you. And she loves you, and ain't nothing you can do about it. <laughs> We're going to have the benediction prayer. They're going to sing. And I remind you, please, sir, please, ma'am, the Bible says, I beseech you, governor, don't move. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this glorious celebration of this wonderful, great soul that has fallen in our midst. But she is not dead. She's alive in each and every one of us. She's alive in 122 countries. 
She's alive in every hall in our government. She's alive in every nonprofit in this nation and around the world. She's alive. She's resting in the arms of Jesus. We ask that you comfort each and every soul here today as her sons and daughters of the Secret Service take her back home to Plains. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Thank you. 